Thank you, Matt. Hey, Matt, was that an original? No. Okay. Well, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. A greater me. woman than I, but made it. <laughs> it's what? Said a greater person than I. Did. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Thank you, thank you. Praise God. God is good. All the time. Last week, we were talking about this idea of God creating and the work that he does. And just to refresh your memory, we, I was really trying to emphasize this idea that it's, it's kind of a misnomer. We use the word in our understanding in the wrong way. Because when we see that God did all this work, we read Genesis chapter 1 all the way through 2, 2. And we come to this point here, it says in 2, 1 and 2, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. And what I tried to do is really emphasize the fact that you and I have got to get out of our picture the limitations of our language, because when God it says he worked, he didn't break a sweat. It was not difficult. It was not strenuous. It did not wear him out. It did not make him tired. When God is, when we read all the things that God created, he was just being himself. I think a better translation would be, when God was having fun, he created this, this on the first day. And then the second day, he decided to have some more fun, so he created all this. It's, it's tragic and unfortunate, but they use the word work here to describe what he did. But it wasn't effort. It, wasn't, it didn't require any effort on his part. He's God. For if, so every once in a while, when, when you know, we read this, and if we got this idea that somehow or another he was tired, or at the end, on the seventh day, he says he rested, if you think that he rested because he was weary, then he is not God. Then he's not God. He wasn't like, oh man, this is so much work. I think I'm just gonna relax. And this was dumb. Because now I gotta get back up. <laughs> um, it, it, it wasn't that way. It, it wasn't that way. For us to truly understand, the whole point I was trying to really emphasize last week is for you and I to really get in our psyche, to really understand that when it says the work of God, he was just being God. It's what he did because of who he is. This morning, I wanna challenge you, and this gonna be one of those messages where it's not gonna be three points and it's kinda of boom, 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 and, and all that. This is gonna be a little bit more challenging, a little more introspective, because I wonder how many times you and I, we do stuff, but we have not yet become transformed so when you and I act like a Christian truly the words are appropriate we are acting like a Christian we have not yet been truly transformed we'll get to that in 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 15 the apostle Paul calls us he says examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith test yourselves do you not know yourselves that Christ, Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. The NIV says, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Or something like that. There is a time, and this morning's message is really one of those times where I'm gonna, I just want to step on your toes a little bit. Because every once in a while, we need it. Amen? Our work, unfortunately, is not like God's work. We work at trying to be a Christian by doing Christian things. God does not intend for that to be that way. He truly wants us to walk in a relationship with him. And that's what discipleship is about. That's what maturity is about. We come to this place where we don't got to think, grunt and groan about what's the right thing to do. We do it because Christ is in us, the hope of glory. We have been transformed. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk 
as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Now he's talking to Christians. And really what he's doing, he's kind of saying, hey, wake up. You and I are supposed to live different. That you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. In other words, they don't know any better. They don't know God. God gives us a whole different way of viewing everything. Because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the de deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, or, or quarreling, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And I like this idea, be imitators of God. What God does is he just, he's God, for us to come to that place in our life, we just do like th we act like Christ would because we spend time with him and he is in us and our lives have been transformed. Be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Verse eight, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. In this idea of looking at our life, being transformed, being truly transformed. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17 says, if anybody is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, the old is past. Behold, all has become new. Again, to the church, as this morning we take an honest inventory, we take an honest look at ourselves to go, hmm, how am I really doing? You see, so often, we want to make sure that we look good on the outside, and we're not honest at looking in the in, at, uh, on the outside, but we're not honest looking in the inside. In Titus chapter 1, verse 16, Titus 1, verse 16, I think this is sad, but too often, it's so true. They profess to know God, but in works, they deny him. There's that idea of working. What do you do? It's this idea, it's your life. It's what you do. They profess to know God, but in works, they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. You know, there have been cases and situations where, obviously, throughout the church, people have asked or wanted to do something, and I've had to be brutally honest and tell them, you know something, I wish you were ready for this, but you are not, you have not yet grown up. Harsh, hard things. The word challenged us this morning. You see, because the question is, do we want to be transformed or transfigured? In Titus chapter 3, verse 8, This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Trans being transformed means it's been from the inside out, and that's how Christianity works. Religion, on the other hand, works on making us transfigured. There's a big difference between being transformed and being transfigured. Transfigured means you just look changed. You look different. It's like the three apostles that met Jesus up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were there, and while they were there, the presence of God, the glory of God shone, and they were like, wow. And uh, Moses and Elijah showed up, and they're like, whoa. It's like really cool. Guess what? They needed to leave there and go back to the real earth. They looked different. 
You see, Christianity needs to change us from the inside that we no longer have to think so hard about, okay, what's a Christian thing to do? We've been transformed into the very image of Jesus Christ. When religion wants to keep you, make a nice long list and keep it running, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't go to movies, you don't you know, play cards, you don't play dice, you don't, don't. After every one of the messages like this, literally, I have people come up to me after first service, I had somebody come up to me and say, Pastor Mike, I grew up back in the day in a church where, boy, that was the big emphasis. You couldn't dance, you couldn't drink, you couldn't smoke, you couldn't play cards, you couldn't. And she says, now that she's older, she looks back and she realizes we were some of the most judgmental people But it never checked the indulgence of the flesh, the internal stuff. Being a Christian, I'm going to share with you five simple things. You don't necessarily need to write them down or nothing like that, but I just want you to, to really see that there are things that happen that God wants us to truly be transformed. And the first one is to surrender. It sounds rather simple, but truly, to surrender is the work of God. John chapter 6, verse 9. John chapter 6, verse 9. Or verse 29, I mean. John chapter 6, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. So if you want to be involved in the work of God, which we all do, we want to be involved in the work of God, right? The first thing, point number one, you have to, foundationally, it starts with you surrendering your life to him. If you're going to do his work, we must be surrendered to him. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if you believe in Christ, old things pass away, but all become new. Unlike these religious people that we read, that they profess to know God, but they don't, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, it says, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. In other words, beware of these people who want to impose upon you all kinds of religious rules, and not in according with Christ. Verse 20, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why as though you lived in the world do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. What he's saying is, you know, it's really easy to make lists, and we love it, our flesh, we love to make lists. Don't do this, and don't do this, and don't do this. He says, why do you live this way? What you need to concentrate is on the change that's happening from within. I remember back in my early Christian days, you know, I got saved, committed my life to the Lord. Things were changed. It's like, wow. And, and there's a guy who, who comes to church, to Maranatha. He's been a long-term member here. Um, he was a young man at that time, and I was much younger. He's now really old. And I'm old. That's right. I remember he, I mean, he, his life just, I mean, it's like it's supposed to be transformed, changed. He spoke at a lot of full gospel businessmen's associations and things like that. I mean, I, and I looked up to him, and I still do. I just still uh, revere him as a, as a great brother. But I tell you what. One day I saw him coming outside the grocery store and he had a cigarette in his mouth. My world was rocked. I was like, oh my goodness, my hero has feet of clay. I remember that really bothered me. I was a young Christian and again, all the Christians that I were around were all about this, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't, like as if that was the greatest things in the world. Obviously, I grew up and became more mature, and I realized that seriously, seriously, if you want to go there sooner and go there smelling like you've been to hell, then go ahead and smoke. You see, here's the problem with that. We make judgments that are not like the judgments of God. 
Steve, I'm going to pick on you today. <laughs> Steve smokes. <gasps> Ooh, hiss. I don't know if he really does. I doubt it. But for now this morning, okay, so you smoke. Yep. I'm going to pick on you because then I'm not telling a lie. <laughs> well, I might be telling a lie in a minute here, but uh, so what is your name? James. James, how long have you been coming? Um, like, it's my first day. Is your first Sunday here? Yeah. Wow, it's really good. Good. I get to pick on you. Okay, James. So, so James smokes. And, and we're like, boo hoo. He, you know what? Friends, here's the thing you're not aware of, and neither am I. But God doesn't care about us smoking right now because he's also covetous. And he's greedy. He's an idolater. I could be lying. You see what I'm saying? Here's the thing. You and I, we make these judgments that, oh, they, he's busy doing this. You guys, we are not the judge. God's got some bigger issues in some people's lives. When we look at the exterior, all this, don't do this, don't do that, we're missing the boat. Because when you're full of greed and envy and lust, gossip, you know, we gossip all the time and we don't give two hoots about it. But we care a lot about smoking and drinking and dancing and going to movies. Okay, in Maranatha, we don't. You, you, you guys get it. You, if, if most of you, I have ruined you from ever going to an Assembly of God church. <laughs> uh, I have. It's these deeper matters that I think oftentimes God is trying to get our attention. And religion wants to tell us, well, as long as you don't smoke and drink and dance and sleep around and you don't do, you know, these, these big 10 or the big whatever, then, oh, then you're good. Being transformed is really asking the question, what's in you? Because, you know, friends, we're all like jelly-filled donuts. We all are. Go ahead and poke. There's filling inside. <laughs> when life bites down on you, you can't help but to let the jelly out. And that's when we find out what you're really made of. When the devil or the world comes and bites down on you, what comes out? Pray for your enemies. Bless those who abuse you. Are them just good things to say or is it true? What do we do? What comes out of us when life bites down? The Bible says that what's in your heart comes out your mouth. What's in your heart comes out your mouth. Somebody's not so kind, they're being a little rude to us. Oh man, forgive me, excuse me. It's like, well, yeah, I can forgive and excuse you, but I'm amazed how many times people, you know, obviously, as a pastor, I make some people a little nervous and uncomfortable. And how many times people apologize for the language? Oh, I'm really sorry about that. Well, it, honestly, I've heard it before. It really doesn't bother me. The reality is, unfortunately, it reveals a lot about what's in you. You know, to be about the work of God, number one, we need to surrender to him. Number two, we need to really change our whole thinking. We need to have our minds transformed. We really need to have our minds transformed. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. In fact, as you go through life, really a safe bet is this. If everybody, if everybody is doing it and you want to please God, do the opposite. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is a way of death. So whatever you're, you're, you're contemplating, whatever most people would do, do it different, and you're probably going to be right on in the plan of God. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. You and I need to be transformed. 
For years, however many years of your life, you thought and lived and acted this way, but all of a sudden Jesus comes along. He wants to transform us so that we don't have to sit and think about everything that we do. Okay, am I being nice? Am I being good? That it becomes a part of us. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy 2, 15. And I don't have it marked. You guys are going to get there before I do, aren't you? Second Timothy two, fifteen it says, "Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth." Be diligent. Friends, for the last several months, coming up into today, we've been emphasizing this word of God. You, you and I need to be men and women of the book. Right now, it'd be a good time for me to leave the platform and come walking up to you and have you recite five Bible verses with the address. Right? You ought to at least know, at a minimum, five Bible verses with the address. When it comes to the word of God, that's what transforms our thinking. We need to read it. We need to study it. We need to memorize it. We need to do it. The word of God, the Bible, is God's inspired word. It's the only conclusive source of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. It is a fountainhead of freeing truth and a goldmine of practical principles waiting to liberate or enrich the person who will pursue its truth and wealth. The word of God. I, I, some of you, I, you tell me all the time, you confess, yeah, Mike, you know, I'm, I don't do very well in my devotions and I don't really, but why? Tragically, I hear all kinds of excuses like, well, I know it's not a very good excuse, but I don't like reading or, you know, my life's really busy. I gotta get up really early for work and we give all these excuses. Ouch, I'm going to step on some of your toes. Be prepared. Because I love you. So you, you, you tell this to me, and I'm going to tell you something. I can tell it in your life. I can tell in your life. So you tell me, you know, I'm really not good at my devotions, and I don't read the Bible. Guess what? I can tell by your life. Tragically, you are stealing and robbing from yourself. You, we could at times, if we're not careful, be these people who profess to know God, but do not have a relationship with him. I thought it would get a little quiet in here today. You know, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, a couple weeks ago I talked about, you know, go ye therefore in all the world and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That word baptism means to be immersed and really come to the conclusion that I don't think it is a baptism formula. I think it's a discipleship formula. That you and I need to be immersed in the presence of the Father. You and I need to be immersed in the presence of the Son. You and I need to be immersed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's talking there about making disciples. He's not giving a baptism formula to be a true disciple. I know this, when you go over to Jordan, they immerse you. You, if you're going to be there, you need to be immersed in prayer and in the presence of God and in the word of God, in truth. It can't be something that's just phony and you kind of add to your schedule. To be truly transformed means that we must be immersed in the presence of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verses 19 through 25. Beginning at verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. The works of the flesh. What, where, you're, where you and I used to live. The works of, of the flesh are evident. They are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred... 
contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders. And you think murder, that doesn't really apply today. You know, we, don't, we, we might not physically murder people today because we're more civilized. But we'll assassinate somebody's character. Drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then it goes on talking about the fruit of the Spirit, which we'll get to in just a moment. But I want to just, I want to go back up for just a quick second. It says, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. We just pause there for a minute, this idea of, of fornication. We never talk about that. The church... You and I have done a horrible job in loving people. Because here's the deal. If somebody's a homosexual, oh, we just, whoa, that's so wrong. That's, guess what? It's in the same list. In fact, in this list, it's not even listed. But fornication is. When's the last time we got bothered by living together, having sex with somebody you're not married to? When's the last time we've gotten just kind of like, that is disgusting. That is breaking the heart of God. No, we don't. But you know something? You and I, we've picked on homosexuals. Really funny, just to make a point. My wife says, Mike, you know, sometimes you can be so irritating. (laughs) Because wherever I am, I'm always poking. I'm always jabbing. I'm always trying to just push and challenge people's thinking and whatever else. I can remember a couple times people have said to me, well, Pastor Mike, what do you think about homosexuality? And, they're just blah, 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 and, they, and they just really want to rant and rail against homosexuals. And I'll usually stop them and say, you know, I have a question for you. Before we go down this road too long, were you a virgin when you got married? No. Well, then shut up. It's the same, it's in the same list of sins. Why? See, you and I as a church, we pick on things and we say, okay, this is what's really, people got to quit smoking, they got to quit drinking. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us, we have fallen short of the glory of God. We have sinned. Let me tell you what, I'm, I'm so excited. After the first service, yeah, I'm excited that I'm crying, right? After the first service, a lady's been coming to church here for, oh, several months now. She came up afterwards, and she greeted me right here. She says, you know, Pastor Mike says, you know, I tried to go to other churches before, and when they found out that I was a lesbian, they, kicked, they wouldn't let me come. She said, but I've been coming here for months, and you just nothing but love me. It's because I love you. I love you. That's between you and God. God's going to work that out with you. When, I mean, this, this issue. Because, you know, quite honestly, there might be some deeper issue that God's working in her life besides her being a lesbian. Again, you and I, we want to pick and, oh, boy, you can't, oh, boy, that's bad. Having no idea of the hurt, the shame, the brokenness that her life has entailed, and she's in a place now that she gets to come and hear about the love of God. Man, I tell you what, if, if we let you fornicators in here, I hope we can let homosexuals in here too. Amen. Hello? Amen. Mia copa, mia copa, mia copa. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. The works of the flesh are obvious and and we sometimes profess God but we don't live in it. We move to the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness. Kindness. We should not have to muster up kindness for people. It should be in us. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. 
if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. I'm going to end with just asking you a couple questions. Do you do Christian things or are you a Christian? If we talked about the works of God, that he didn't have to really work to do it. He just was acting on being God. He just, that's who he was. I would like to think, and have to admit, this point came from my thought about this guy, idea of God working, that I thought, how come it is that you and I are not like that? You and I have to muster up, and we gotta work so hard to realize, okay, people are watching, I gotta do the good Christian thing. No, you don't. You should be able to just be you, and that means being a Christian. That it's not that difficult. The problem and the tragedy is way too often it is. Friends, I, I love you. I'm stepping on your toes a little bit because the scripture says every once in a while, every communion time, it says a, a man ought to examine himself. In 2 Corinthians, we read this morning this idea that you need, we need to test ourselves, take a personal moral inventory. How are we doing? Because I can tell you this, by looking at the outside, the way you act and the way you talk and the way you whatever else, you all look perfect to me. Till your neighbor talks to me. Tell other people, tell me, you're not gonna believe that person who goes to your church, yeah, they have this great thing going on. Let me tell you what, how he acts at work. Let me tell you how she talks to other pe about other people. Let me hear, they tell on you. Do you do Christian things or are you a Christian? That's the test. Is it work for you to be honest? Is it work for you to be moral? Is it work for you to love God? Is it work or is it difficult for you to worship? Is it work for you to love people? Is it work for you to give? Is it work for you to pray? Is it work for you to share Christ with others? If it is, then you truly have not yet become surrendered and growing as a disciple of Christ. Because just as God created things, he was just doing what he did. You and I ought to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, not by doing, but by being. This is who we are. This is what we do. Second Corinthians 13, five, would you put it up there? I'm not gonna find it in here. This morning, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you know your... Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are unqualified. Psalm 139. The very last two verses of that psalm, Psalm 23 and 24, is a great prayer, but it's scary if you'll be honest praying it. Because this is a prayer not for the faint of heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. Could you imagine if we would pray a prayer like that more often in sincerity? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the service. I thank you for those little times where your word brings conviction, where your word steps on our toes. I don't wanna be transfigured. Lord, we wanna be transformed. We wanna be transformed into the image of your son, Jesus. That we don't have to think about loving people, it's just in us we love people. To be filled with Christ, to be filled with you means to be filled with love for people. Help us to realize that we are not the judge of what you're working on in somebody's life. 
You love them. You're working on issues much de deeper like idolatry and gossip and slander. And eventually you'll get to some of these other things in their life. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us as Christians at Maranatha to truly think through the issue. If we love fornicators and they feel comfortable in church, how come we can't love homosexuals and they feel comfortable in church? We make thieves feel comfortable. Gossips, slanderers. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we do a, an inventory, a personal examination of our lives, that you would draw us broken before you at your feet to worship you and to acknowledge that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we need you. We need you. Thank you for running after us to fill us with your reckless love. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. God is good.